In a lowland forest on the big island of Hawaii, a small native bird called the amakihi is making a comeback. The Hawaiian honeycreepers once thrived throughout the islands, but after several centuries of habitat destruction and disease, they are now confined primarily to the high slopes of Hawaii's volcanoes. A group of scientists and volunteers has teamed up to find out why the amaki is repopulating the lowlands. Modern biological detectives, they use clues from genetics to parasitology to discover what is so special about this native bird. What they learn may help save the rest of Hawaii's disappearing forest birds. In lowland forests where native honeycreepers are nearly extinct, the re-emergence of the amakihi came as a surprise. I'll never forget the first time that we went down to one of the low elevation sites. We got out of the car and stood there, and there were dozens of amakihi singing. This is right in the middle of a suburban subdivision down there. And we were just totally amazed, you know, having lived here for 10 years, you know, why hadn't we gone down there to, to see what was going on? Why is the Amakihi's population increasing? Solving the mystery means understanding the complex interaction of island history, ecology, and evolution. On the front lines of the investigation, young volunteers spend hundreds of hours gathering data in the field. Oh, is this one of the tree fern cattle? Yep, this is uh, actually a really good example. This is what the pigs do. We got a lot of pigs in this area, and uh, one of their favorite foods is the starchy pith that runs through the center of these tree fern. And uh, they'll knock them right over and start tearing through the fibrous area here, and then gnawing through this, this kind of woody section. Once they've scooped the pith out, they leave a bowl, this wooden bowl that'll collect water, rainwater, and really provides an excellent spot for mosquitoes. The reason the remaining populations of honeycreepers exist primarily in upper elevation forests throughout the state and not in the middle to lower elevation forests is because of mosquitoes transmitting malaria and pox. So what we have today is a situation where there's very few native birds in low to middle elevation areas and in the few bands of nice forest that we have left in higher elevation is where most of the native birds still exist. Volcanic soils are porous, making them inhospitable to mosquito larvae. This is, in some forests, really the only habitat there is for larval mosquitoes. So mosquitoes finding this will lay their eggs in there. And then the larvae are developing for anywhere from a couple of weeks in the real warm parts of the summer to probably a few months in the later parts and cooler parts of the year. Not long ago, Hawaii had no mosquitoes. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles from the nearest continent, it was just too far to fly. No one really knows how mosquitoes first got to the Hawaiian Islands, but um, at least the story that's embedded in the literature is that a ship recently out of Mexico, the Wellington, had come into port in Lahaina, Maui, and the sailors were in the process of uh, changing over the water casts, and they were bringing wooden water casts from the ship to shore and were emptying them out in a stream bed to refill, and presumably that's when mosquitoes first arrived in Hawaii. The only real evidence that uh, this event actually occurred in 1826 and associated with the Wellington is based on some journal entries of a local physician who had uh, entered in at this just about this time that some of the local inhabitants had come to him talking about a new fly that sang in their ears. Several more accidental importations were to follow. With the arrival of a mosquito vector, the parasite that causes malaria could now be spread from bird to bird. The disease results in severe anemia in susceptible birds by destroying red blood cells, but it is harmless to humans. The Hawaiian honeycreepers were originally distributed from sea level all the way to the tree line 
on the islands. And the main centers of their populations were probably primarily at lower elevation, where food resources and other factors were more hospitable for them. It's hard to believe that so recently, Hawaii was teeming with native birds. Some of the early naturalists that arrived here described huge flocks of birds that we don't even have today. In the flocks were Akialoa, which had bills two and a half inches long, and O'u's that fed on fruit. And the O'u would come down to people's backyards and, and eat their papayas and mangoes. In the late 1800s, the O'u was considered to be one of the most abundant Hawaiian honeycreepers, and now it's most likely extinct. The Hawaiian Islands are the most isolated archipelago in the entire world. They're about 4,000 kilometers from the nearest continent. And as a result, not very many organisms were able to make it across the expanse of ocean and colonize the islands. However, about four or five million years ago, we believe a small group of finches, something like a house finch that you might see in the feeder in your backyard, did manage to make it across the Pacific Ocean from, we think, North America and colonize the islands. This small group of birds not only survived, but thrived. One group of birds was able to take advantage of the nectar resources in the ohia flowers and become nectivores. Another group evolved into seed eaters, birds that specialize on seeds and get very hard, strong beaks to exploit that resource. Another group have long, beautiful, decurved bills that they use to probe the insects out of the bark. And as a result, the finch ancestor underwent an adaptive radiation that rivals anything we see elsewhere in the world and rivals even the Galapagos finches, which are perhaps more famous. This original flock of finches that arrived here evolved into a minimum of 54 different species and subspecies, all within a relatively short period of time. Of this unparalleled diversity, the majority have gone extinct, and only a handful of the remaining honeycreepers are abundant enough to stay off the federal endangered species list. For most of the 20th century, people really had no idea as to why so many populations of native Hawaiian honeycreepers were declining. And then in the 60s, scientists began to understand that avian malaria could be a major factor responsible for this decline. Hawaii is a favorite vacation destination. Before the flora and fauna, the islands are a troubled paradise. Long before mosquitoes and malaria, other factors began to set the stage for extinction. Habitat destruction was primary among them. Both in Polynesian times and Western times, there's been huge areas of land that have been degraded, land that was very important for many different species of honeycreepers. In the 1920s and 30s, the forests were becoming more silent and people began bringing cage birds from Asia and North America to introduce into the wild to increase the populations of songbirds in the forests. And it's thought that these birds were reservoirs for avian malaria. And this was when a second wave of die-offs began occurring, where all of the remaining low elevation populations of native birds began to really decline. Non-native birds brought malaria to the islands, but soon native birds were infecting each other. Non-native birds, a single infected mosquito bite, will not even infect most of the birds that are exposed. They may require as many as five or ten bites before you can even detect the parasite in the blood. By contrast, a native bird, a single mosquito bite, is enough to infect almost 100 percent of the birds that are exposed. Once they're infected, native birds carry a heavy parasite load, and they become reservoirs for the disease. As native birds perished in record numbers, the introduced birds prospered on their adopted islands. The reason? Genetic resistance, which evolved from a long association with the disease. Unlike native honeycreepers, their ancestors were exposed to malaria in their original mainland habitats. Natural selection eliminated the most susceptible, and only those who could fight the infection survived. Since the ability to mount an immune response to malaria is inherited, whole populations eventually became resistant. The scientists also hypothesized that non-native birds have evolved more defensive behaviors than native birds, 
Since the mosquitoes transmit malaria, natural selection should favor individuals that do not tolerate them. At the labs of the USGS Kilauea Field Station, the scientists expose native and non-native birds to mosquitoes to test this idea. Most non-native birds jump and peck when approached to protect vulnerable areas of the skin. At the end of the experiment, very few mosquitoes successfully feed. In contrast, many honey creepers perch for long periods of time without noticing the mosquitoes probing for blood around their feet. While Amakihis vary in their response, in some species, every bird gets bitten. The mosquitoes in this experiment don't actually carry malaria, but if they did, the results would be deadly. The geographic isolation of the Hawaiian Islands has resulted in genetic isolation as well, and this can have some pretty severe consequences uh, from an evolutionary standpoint in, in the native Hawaiian birds. They have not seen a lot of the infectious diseases that mainland birds have seen, and so they haven't had a chance to develop resistance through natural selection processes. But if this is the case, why are low-elevation Amakihi nearly three times more likely to survive malaria than high-elevation birds of the same species? Could natural selection be at work here too? It's dawn. High on the slopes of Mauna Loa volcano, the song of native honey creepers greets the day and a crew of volunteers from the USGS Biological Resources Division sets off for the field. Sometimes hiking miles across hardened lava, the work can be grueling. But if they're lucky, they will see some of the only living examples of the most endangered birds in the world. Oh, you know what it is? What? That's, that's a female akepa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The bird crew monitors mist nets throughout each day, bringing the birds they catch back to a central banding station for individual marking and to collect vital data on disease. I got two. What'd you get, Brian? I've got a uh, Hatcher Yeevee and a really oh. nice looking up Makihi. First Yeevee of the day. At one time, scientists focused their research almost exclusively on high elevation forests, where native bird populations are still intact. But with the re-emergence of the low elevation Amakihi, they started to turn their attention downslope toward the ocean to compare the disease between the populations. So what you want to look at the most on this one? Like is, is he pretty bright, uniform? Okay. Or is it patchy? Like a second year bird? Second year male will be really patchy. So he's not patchy. I would say he's uniform. Yeah. Their work is part of a large-scale study of avian disease called the Biocomplexity Project, an unprecedented effort sponsored by the National Science Foundation, USGS, and the University of Hawaii. Biocomplex to me is like a, a large jigsaw puzzle with lots and lots of interlocking pieces. In the past, we've always relied on just looking at one little piece of this puzzle and one spot over a certain length of time for research studies. What biocomplexity is doing, which is really unique, is taking all the interlocking pieces of this puzzle and looking at how they, they interact with each other. And to do this, you know, we have teams of forest bird biologists and vector ecologists. We have a food resources team, a, a pathogens biology team, a genetics team. And tying this all together is our modeling team, which is going to help us link these different disciplines together. And we are really are trying to take this study from the level of the gene all the way to the level of the landscape, which is something that hasn't really been done before. One of our most important questions is how Hawaii Amakihi are able to persist in the lowland forests in the presence of avian malaria when none of the other native Hawaiian forest birds appear to be able to do so. Hawaiian Amakihi at low elevation are infected with malaria at a higher rate than any other Hawaiian honeycreepers we've studied, about 60 to 90 percent of the individuals show evidence of chronic malaria infection, which means they've had the disease and have survived. If we can understand the factors that allow Hawaii Amakihi to persist, it might hold the key to preservation of the remaining Hawaiian avifauna. An important task of the bird crew is to collect blood samples for DNA analysis so that the geneticists can find out if natural selection is at work on the low elevation Amakihi populations. Here are those low-elevation field samples for you. Thanks, Beth. Get started on logging them in. What is so unique about the Amakihi? 
which allows it to survive. One of the primary objectives of this biocomplexity project is to look at these low elevation populations because nobody has really studied them in any great detail. And so we're looking at the genetics of these birds to find out if there are any particular genes or gene systems that might be providing a degree of resistance to this parasite. If the low elevation Almakihi are evolving, the scientists need to understand the selective forces at work. They must determine the parasite load of individual birds and the extent of malaria in each population. When the bird crew is out in the field and they have a live bird in hand, it's virtually impossible to tell whether that bird has malaria by just looking at it. So we have to rely on several tests of the blood to see if it has evidence of infection. And what they do is spin the blood down and separate it into the, the pack cells, the red blood cell component, which eventually goes to the geneticist and the serological component, the clear part, which comes to us, and we run serological tests on that. Um, the bird crew also makes a blood smear, which we take back and stain, and we look at that under the microscope and actually try to find the parasites inside the red blood cells. The scientists also monitor mosquito populations throughout the year to determine how many are at each elevation and whether or not they are carrying malaria. Mosquito crew baits traps with dry ice and places them in the forest canopy. Birds and other warm-blooded animals emit carbon dioxide, which attracts female mosquitoes looking for nourishment for their eggs. The ice releases the CO2 and lures the mosquitoes into the traps. Near the ground, wet traps attract mosquitoes looking for a place to lay their eggs. What we find, in fact, is that there are very few mosquitoes at the high elevations where most of the native bird communities are intact. There is a number of factors uh, leading to this situation. One is, of course, that it's cooler at those elevations, so it takes a much longer time for mosquitoes to develop. They're going to be smaller numbers of populations overall and, and fewer population um, broods, if you will, over the course of a year. What does this mean for the Amakihi? The populations at high elevations are not nearly as exposed to the uh, disease as those at mid and low elevations. So this upper elevation population, particularly in the Amakihi, which is a sedentary species, can serve as our control. One of the genetic methods we're using for evaluating diversity in these Amakihi um, populations is called AFLP, or Amplified Fragment Length Polymorphism, a method that allows you to look at uh, variability across the entire genetic code of those birds. And so we can take blood samples that are collected out in the field and bring them in and extract the DNA from them. And we can use these procedures and look at uh, variability. And what you see is a banding pattern that's very similar to a DNA fingerprint. And this DNA fingerprint allows you to look at uh, particular bands that might be present in higher frequencies in low elevation populations that might be absent in high elevation populations. The scientists can't rule out other explanations for the Amakihi's survival at low elevations. For example, if conditions are more favorable to birds in the warmer lowlands, they might be better at fighting disease or producing young. Bob Peck is trying to find the answers to the Amakihi's success in the forest canopy itself. He samples insects and spiders, an important food source for the Amakihi and some of the other honey creepers. He wants to find out if there is a link between the abundance of food and susceptibility to disease. Birds that are more fit nutritionally may be more susceptible to disease than birds that are, that are more stressed nutritionally. Our aim is to measure arthropod abundance at the different sites and see if there is any kind of a linkage between nutritional fitness and susceptibility to disease. Bird feathers have growth bars which are similar to tree rings and vary in size depending on conditions. From a feather we can measure the distance between bars and, and then use that as an index of nutritional health of the bird. Nutritional health and its effect on chronic infection could influence the Amakihi's reproductive success in the lowlands. One question we'd really like to know is 
how many nests do these birds have per year? And is it more than at high elevation? Are they laying more eggs in a given nest? Are they fledging more young from those nests than the high elevation populations of birds? And so really, the only way to get at these ideas is to find nests of birds and monitor them over time um, so that we can get an understanding of the success rate of these birds in the low elevation areas. Hey, Eric, I think I found an Amakihi nest over here by the banding station. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm going to watch it for a while, and then um, if nothing's going on, I'll uh, get the mirror pole out and um, see what's happening in there. Nest searching is a little frustrating because we didn't really know what's going to happen down here since no one's ever really done nest searching at the low elevations. So it was a lot of looking and not finding anything. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. Despite their predictions, almost every nest the bird crew found during the first two years of searching failed due to predation. It's clear that environmental factors alone are inadequate to explain the Amakihi success in the lowlands. And there are some very nice clustering of low Back at the genetics lab, the results are in. Here we are. We have the individual DNA banding patterns with all the low elevation uh, birds in that upper cluster on the left and the high elevation uh, birds on the right. And what we're looking for are uh, bands that might be unique to low elevation populations okay. that high elevation birds don't have. What we see right off the bat are that there are two um, very good candidate bands. This upper band is present in 95% uh, of the low elevation birds and completely absent in the high mm -hmm. elevation. So I think uh, we should go ahead, go back to the gel okay. and uh, pull those bands out, clone them, sequence them, see what, see they, what are. they are. The populations themselves are changing by adapting to the disease. What we're finding in this biocomplexity project is that there are a tremendous amount of amakihi that are able to uh, survive with the parasite, and so there must be some coevolution processes taking place. I believe this uh, documents evolution in action. The scientists are just beginning to understand the physiology behind the low elevation Amakihi's resistance to malaria and the genes or gene systems involved. But this much is clear. In less than 200 years since mosquitoes first arrived in Hawaii aboard a whaling ship, rapid evolution has shaped the future of the Amakihi. This low elevation population, we think, holds a lot of keys to how native birds in Hawaii are going to go over the next 100 years. Because this is a good example of coevolution between a limiting factor, a serious limiting factor like avian malaria or avian disease and a native species, and how the two can change to, to become adapted to each other. Will the lowlands once again team with honey creepers? Only if scientists and managers can interrupt the disease cycle so that healthy birds may again take advantage of the lush forests without becoming victims of disease. We hope that one outcome of this study is that low elevation forests will not be seen as a wasteland for native birds, but as potential areas for restoration and recolonization of not only the species that are existing here now, but other species that are declining throughout the state. One day, a vaccine that blocks disease transmission may become a reality. Until then, efforts to reestablish other species in the lowlands will have to take into account genetic diversity and disease resistance. The bottom line for biocomplexity has always been to try to take the things we're learning from research and adapt them to management. This can range from looking at how land use changes affect the disease system and transmission of the disease to identifying markers that we can use to identify in some of the more endangered birds, individuals that we can bring into captivity for captive propagation. Research on avian disease in Hawaii is not just about saving an isolated group of birds in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. One of the more exciting things about biocomplexity goes beyond the Hawaiian Islands, and that is that the work we do here is relevant to mosquito-borne diseases throughout the world. That's mosquito-borne diseases of wildlife, as well as human diseases such as human malaria or West Nile virus. Meanwhile, the lowlands no longer belong to the cardinal, the house finch, or the minor bird. 
From subdivisions to lava beaches, the song of the Amakihi continues to grow. Mm-hmm.